If you're interested in what I look like in real life and want to learn more about me, then follow my Instagram page at Joe the Insomniac. Hello everyone. I hope we're all getting settled into the Halloween mood nicely. I've got some really cool videos coming out which are completely different from anything I've done before. I just got all the filming done on that. So make sure you keep your heads up for that. And before we start this video, I want to know, what's the most scary thing that's ever happened to you in the woods, while camping, or anything really? I think mine wasn't too bad, but I went jogging once and managed to get stranded out in one at midnight. Or probably not midnight, <laughs> probably like, um, eight or something, but it got dark really quick. But luckily, I managed to see a McDonald's, and that actually guided me back to safety, funnily enough. But yeah, let me know in the comments below, and I hope you'll enjoy this video. Back in 2008, I was a student planning to go to university, and needed some extracurricular stuff that I was able to put on my applications. As most UK students know, one of the best things to have on there is a Duke of Edinburgh award. As part of this award, you have to embark on an orienteering expedition. Basically, a long trek through woodland and rural villages, following nothing but a map and compass. No GPS allowed. It's a teamwork experience and you can camp and overcome hurdles together. Anyway, I was out of shape at the time, so my uncle volunteered to take me out to the middle of nowhere to get some idea of what orienteering was like. We didn't stay out overnight like I would have thought, but hiked maybe 10 miles through the woods, in a small village, in a pretty Amso area. By the end of the journey, we're soaked to the bone, miserable, looking forward to heading home. For the last part of the journey, we're on a dirt trail, heading uphill with bushes and trees either side. We were marching onwards in silence at this point, when all of a sudden, there's a rustling in the foliage to our left. Now from behind a large bush, steps an old man in a black suit with a red bow tie and dress shoes. He looked like he's in his late 70s and early 80s, very pale, liver spots dotting his face in a grey white comb over. I was instantly weirded out. Who dresses like this to go into the woods? The instant thought seeing a guy here is that he's lost a plot. There was something else that took an extra moment for me to notice though. It puzzles me. He's bone dry, not even dirt on his shoes, something that should not be possible. We stopped in our tracks and just stared at the man for a moment, who appeared to be as froze and shocked at seeing us. My uncle made the first move, taking a step towards him, asking if he's alright. The man continued to stare for a moment, not even moving a twitch. Then, suddenly, becomes very animated. It was almost as though he suddenly snapped out of a trance. He started flailing his arms wildly, saying something awful happened that a good friend of his needed help. He began walking backwards to the woods, mentioning for us to follow him, of which we did. 
We started off as a brisk walk, then escalate to running as we struggled to keep up with this old man. After a minute, he disappeared ahead of us, but we could hear him, so continue to follow the noises until we reach a huge slope, probably a 40 degree angle, spanning perhaps 50 feet or more, and slick with mud. It looked like an accident waiting to happen, especially given there were no shrubs or roots to hold on to or anything. I remembered looking down at the old man on the other side of the slope, wondering how the hell did he cross that so quickly and cleanly? I mean, that distance is hard to see fine detail clearly, but I swear he still did not appear to be wet or muddy whatsoever. Me and my uncle looked at each other, and I saw that he was getting as weirded out as I was. Despite my feelings, I stepped towards the edge, trying to make my way down, when my uncle grabbed me firmly by the arm, pulling me back. Under his breath, he said to me, Something's wrong here. I don't like it. We took a few steps back from the edge at this point, and the old man at the bottom started getting a rate. He began pleading with us to come down, saying his friend needed our help. He's in trouble. My uncle shouted down to the old man that we're going to head back to our car and call emergency services, that professional help would be on its way soon, that they would have the tools and everything necessary to help. The old man suddenly got furious. He began jumping up and down, demanding that we come down the slope right now, or there'll be hell to pay. His voice has now changed drastically. He was practically growling his words. His hands bunched up into fists, pounding his knees like an angry toddler for an tantrum. I've never seen a grown adult fly into such a rage in my life. His eyes look as though they're on the verge of bursting out of their sockets his skin gone from pale red to almost an intense colour. We now begin to hurriedly make our way back the way we come. He demands and threatens us as we get closer to the trowel. Once on the trowel, we practically power march the remaining quarter mile or so to the car all the while my uncle was on the phone to the emergency services, explaining to them that there's a possibly mentally ill old man wandering the trowel. We're ordered to get out of the car and away at the police so we could show them what we've encountered. About an hour later, we meet four officers, two of whom had dogs with them, and packs of supplies like first aid, emergency blankets, etc. We lead them to the exact spot, and then pointed the two officers with dogs in the direction that he led us through the bushes. The search lasted a week, but there's no trace of the old man. Officers said the only trail they could pick up on had been mine and my uncle's. They didn't find any footprints or anything belonging to the old man that we encountered. We still have no idea what happened to this day. When I was around nine years old, I had two of my friends over to play and hang out. I lived in a small neighbourhood, in a small town, 
that her other neighbourhood was full of either elderly or young couples with new families and kids to play with. The girls I was hanging out with that day lived in my neighbourhood as well and were the same age as me. My neighbourhood looped into a circle with part of it connected round the end of the street. My friends and I always walked down there because there was a little trowel that went into the woods with the cute rustic wooden bridge over a stream. We had also discovered our way from the woods into a whole new area of a nearby neighbouring neighbourhood. So we liked to walk through to the other side. Recently, they started construction in the woods. There's a couple of new clearings full of dirt piles to make way for new homes in the woods. That day, it's super muddy, raining the night before, and we all wore rubber rain boots. Started down the path, stopping at the bridge. I just gotten a new digital camera, so we start taking a selfie together on the bridge, or the old version. We thought this was super fun, because especially at this age, none of us really had our own cameras or phones, although I had a little flip phone in case of emergency that my mum insisted I bring with me on our walk. After our group pictures and blurry pictures of the forest, we kept going down the paths. Eventually, we get to a clearing where they just cleared out to prepare for construction. We are climbing the giant piles of dirt and sand, outstretching our arms, pretending that we're looking down at the rest of the world. I snap a few pictures from the woods from my vantage point. We laugh as the dirt beneath one of my friend's feet gave way, and she slid down the dirt hill on her butt. We were just easy going, Innocent kids that had fun over the little things that I'm getting at. Eventually, we decided to venture back home. And we were walking down one of the little trails. I've always had good intuition. As we're walking, suddenly I felt my stomach flip-flop. And... I froze in my path, looking around nervously. I just felt as though we were being watched. My friends heard my footfalls crease and began asking me, What's the matter? What are you doing? I shushed them, now gesturing for them to be quiet with my hand. We all freeze, looking around but none of us saw anything, eventually going back. But one of the girls breaks silence. She says nothing's here and we're fine, but I could not shake the feeling. Uneasily, I follow them and walk in ahead of them protectively, since it seems as though I could always sense trouble. But now, I stop in my tracks, as we rounded a corner, I see two grown men facing us, ahead on the long path we're taking, each one carrying something. I only looked briefly, but it appears as though one of them is carrying either a chainsaw or normal saw and the other like a hammer or small metal bat. One's wearing a black t-shirt, 
the other one a long blue t-shirt I told my friends run we turn around sprinting down the path we've just taken boots splattering the mud everywhere I look over my shoulder still running still following us I said quick to the other neighborhood we keep going waving through the trees and bushes and fawns it was like a cliche movie scene as one of my friends fell frantically scared I helped her up we keep on running eventually we could all see the trees thinning as we neared the other area and we ran though as our feet now finally hit the pavement we didn't stop we keep booking it through the neighborhood eventually getting far enough away where we can turn and look at the entrance to the woods and the two men are there staring at us they hadn't entered the neighborhood probably because it's public but we could see them shirts from where we stood the neighborhood we're in now was about a 10 minute drive from my home on a main road which is why we like taking the woods since there's no sidewalks however being 10 or nine and fearing that followed us from the woods we get to the main road and call my mom eventually she came to get us we're all shocked and crying a little and my mom calls the police they search the area but never find a sign of them thing is there's never anyone in the woods maybe they were construction workers but there wasn't any construction going on the thing that really proves their bad intentions is that they chased us three nine-year-old girls through the woods with weapons that's why i always trust my guards I was about eight or nine years old when this happened. I grew up in a small town in Norway, so stuff like this happening never really concerned me that much, considering this is a very safe place to grow up. Anyway, my brother played for our local soccer team with his classmates, and they were going away for like a two day tournament or something like that they had to be accompanied by their parents because he's just four years older than me and they were too young to be sent alone now this meant that no one could take care of me that weekend so I had to come along with them all quite frankly I wanted to because this is quite a big city and considering I was used to the rural town area this would have been a great experience for me so on one of the days while we stayed there I got bored of watching the soccer matches and got approval to go explore the surrounding area as long as I didn't stray too far away I got my friend to come with me we eventually stumbled upon a secluded dirt track surrounded by woods now after walking for a while we found a mattress I thought this was odd now we were living at the edge of a field really close to dense forests surrounding it so we're kind of used to this we start jumping on the mattress having fun while all of a sudden 
this creepy dude in probably his 50s or 60s sits down on the mattress staring at us. Ask him for our names and what we're doing there and if we could show him our skills. I obliged to his request showing him some tricks but I was feeling scared at the time because somehow in my mind I was convinced he's an alcoholic. Now I was scared really by any means of anyone who drank alcohol in my younger days. Anyway, a few minutes pass and he says if we'd be so kind to him to retrieve his crutch that he stashed somewhere behind a building, pointing to a building like 500 meters away which appears abandoned, I answered to him that we could. We started walking towards where he pointed and my friend starts walking as well. I silently whisper in my friend's ear that he's an alcoholic and we should run. My friend didn't get the big deal so I had to argue with him to get him with me when finally he obliged. When we saw that we had a good distance from him, we ran as fast as we could towards the way we come. All I could hear in the background was a man shouting, hey, get back here. I didn't turn to look once and didn't stop running until I saw my parents. No idea what he was planning to do, but I know it was nothing good. No, this story happened about two years ago, while well, I was in university working on my degree in biology. I signed up for a trip to gather samples for an experiment some students in the ecology department were going to run for us. It required the collection of samples from several sites so they could recruit biology ecology and forestry majors to help them collect in samples. The area my group was to take samples from was a few hours from my uni in the Pacific Northwest. There are nine of us in my group, eight students and a supervising professor. So we go up to the campsite in the late evening setting up our tents. One of the other students had a big container of split pea soup from home, sharing it with the others on the trip. No, I really don't care for pea soup. So I declined the offer. Everyone had some except me, one other student and the professor. Come the next morning, the five students who had eaten the soup weren't in the best of shape. They're in the grips of some gnarly food poisoning, in no shape to hike for eight or nine hours. The professor who was supervising us had originally set some rules as people travel in at least two and we had to return to camp by nightfall. Now those rules were tossed out in order to make sure that we keep to our timetable and collected all the required samples. We were just told, do your best to complete the work assigned as long as you do it safely. That morning, I set out for a long day of hiking after a mile or so, I ran into the stream I'm supposed to follow. I needed to travel about four miles upstream, stopping every quarter mile to collect samples of water and soil. This meant I had to hustle to get back before dark. Halfway through the day, I realized that that wasn't going to happen. 
About two miles into my hike, I stopped for lunch sitting on a log overlooking the stream. The scene was really peaceful until I smelled cigarettes. It was not the smell of the cigarette being smoked, more the musty smell of a heavy smoker's car where the cigarette butts have been left to ferment for weeks on end. I look around and see no one. I just assumed that the wind had blown the scent of some hunter or hiker over to me, but minutes later, the smell had not faded. The vegetation in the area wasn't thick, but there was still a lot of places for someone to duck behind a tree or bush. I was unnerved that someone was trying to stay close enough to me to smell them for this long without saying a word. I quickly packed up the trash from my lunch and continue up the stream. Now the smell went away for the next few hours. It wasn't until I arrived at my last sample location late into dusk that I smelt it again. The woods were getting really dim now. Looking back on it, it was a stupid idea to stay out there so late. As just camping back along the journey was dangerous enough, even without a smoking stalker. Having put the collection tubes in my bag, I shine my flashlights around the darkening woods looking for whoever was given off the smell. I don't see anything that catches my attention. It's actually more correct to say I saw too many things in that dim light that may have actually been a head sticking out from behind a tree or someone crouching down in low foliage. I did not like the idea of being in the dark woods with a stranger who for the second time was lurking near me without revealing themselves. So I began to double time it back down the stream. I make much better time on my way back, even though it's dark because I didn't have to stop taking any samples. Even so, I don't get back to camp till a bit before 10. I was the last one to get back. Everyone but the professor's already asleep. I didn't mention the cigarette smell to the professor because he seems very tired and is heading back to his RV soon after I get packed up. I now head to my tent soon after. At some point in the night, I woke up needing to pee. I decided to head into the woods to do my business as I knew some of the other students were feeling ill and needed the RV toilet more urgently than someone having to take a leak. I walk about a hundred feet into the wood, finding a tree. As I go to turn back to the campsite, something caught my eye. Somewhere off in the woods was a tiny red glow. I was confused as to what it was until it flared momentarily and I realised it's a cherry of a cigarette. I stood there for a while watching the red ember glow fade, moving slightly closer to the ground as whoever was smoking would take it out of their mouth. Not being able to see the person, I assumed they were watching the camp. I did not know if they had seen me make my way to the woods or not, as the fire had been doused. The moon was only half full, there's not much light. 
I made my way slowly back to the camp as quietly as I can. Entering the RV to wake up the professor, I tell him about the smoking person in the woods, about the smell of cigarettes. However, when he got outside the RV, the ember's gone. My professor woke up the other student who hadn't come down with food poisoning. We take turns to watch over the camp. I didn't see or smell anything else when I'm on guard duty and went to sleep when the professor woke up for his turn. In the morning, the professor, other students and I went to where I guess the smoker had been standing the night before and sure enough, we find about 10 cigarette butts on the ground next to a tree. The tree itself looked like somebody had been twisting, stabbing a knife and other sharp objects into it, as most of the outer layers of it had been chipped away. The professor decided the group should head back, even though we hadn't collected enough samples. We pack up camp drive down the thin dirt trail without incident. Now the second we get onto the paved highway, a white van pulls out of the clearing, beginning to follow us. This van stayed behind us, all the way back, falling off the highway when we did, taking the same surface streets that we did only stopping briefly to then follow us, but eventually going away as we turned, heading towards our university campus. Everyone's freaked out, but it's around nine at night on a weekend, so the security office is closed. We decide to unload the RV call it a night as a van hadn't followed us onto campus. I offer to help the professor catalogue and store the collection tubes from our trip. So, it's another couple hours before I left the biological sciences building, now heading towards the dorm building that I lived in. I stepped out in the cool night air and began walking. My professor having left the building in the other direction to get to his car and drive home. It's a couple dozen feet outside the building which is now locked. I'm hit with the musty smell of old cigarettes. I look around. About 25 yards away in darkness. I see that cherry light again, of a cigarette smouldering away. I'm pretty scared now, but hope it's only a student, or something, just anything else. I couldn't completely convince myself, as the musty cigarette smell was the same smell that I smelt in the woods. I started down the footpath and soon passed whoever was smoking. A hundred feet or so later, I look over my shoulder and saw the cherry of a cigarette in the darkness. The smoker is now following me. This creeps me out a bit more, but I still held it together. That is until I rounded a small stand of trees and saw a white van parked alone in a parking lot. I took off at a sprint towards my dorm building, looking over my shoulder for a few steps. Into my run, I see the cherry of the cigarette on the ground now and a dark shape following me. I don't look back again, but I could hear someone running 
in the grass off the footpath. I got to my entrance to my dorm building, frantically waving my key card. As soon as I hear the soft beep, I jump in, closing and locking it quickly. I now very quickly turn around, peering through the glass. I saw a dark shape stop just short of the lip halfway. I watch for a minute or so, then I see the spark of a lighter. The light is just barely enough to illuminate a shaggy beard and the brim of a baseball cap before it disappears, replaced with the glow of a cigarette. I turn around, head up the stairs. By the time I make it to the window, there's no trace. And this is the last I ever saw of that person or that lone cigarette glow. So let me set the stage. At the time, I was living in Transverse City, Michigan. It's got a beautiful landscape for those wondering. Huge glaciers carved into the hills and Lake Michigan at your back. I rented a little townhouse with a longtime friend, a little ways outside the city. I'd gotten a hold of my old bicycle, which I'd shipped out from where my old home was and was riding it around. That's how all of this got started. So it's actually my day off and I decide to save gas, riding my bike into town. I geared up checking my tires and roared off. If I'd been big on riding my bike once upon a time, I wasn't the same now and struggle a bit. Now if I'd been paying attention, I would have realised a constant downward slope I was on and how biking up would be very difficult with my winter lapsed muscles, but none of it mattered. I made it into town, did some shopping, met up with my roommate for dinner, and had a good time until the sun was setting. So I jump on my bike, pedalling off into the sunset. At first I did a riot, but that aforementioned incline wore me down. By the time I reach the last leg of my journey, it's pitch black. I was walking my bike, at which point the road faced me with a choice. To my left was a regular road, which was better lit, but also a longer trek to the townhouse now occupied. To my right was my more regular route to and from town, I drove it every day, and had used it to come into town that very day in fact. It was heavily wooded and unlit, but featured a shorter route with a steeper hill. I figured that since I was already walking, I may as well take the shorter, familiar path. So I turn on my bike's headlamp into the great darkness through the woods. All went well for a bit. I trudged along, cursing myself for being so stupid and overconfident. Then I hear it. Footsteps to my right side in the woodland. I stand still, and they stop abruptly. They're in blackness. I debate what it might be, but as a veteran of the woods, I hope it's just local wildlife and continue on. The footsteps start up again, stopping when I stop, and just a hint of them later on. 
I started and stopped once more, to be sure I wasn't hearing things. The last time, the steps continued for a solid 10 seconds after I stopped, making me sure something or someone was out there. I still didn't know what, though logically, leaning towards humans as probably humans. Now my mind stayed so on edge. I knew I had a utility knife in my purse, but I shoved that thought aside. I have enough martial arts training to know that a knife's a bad idea. I was more comfortable taking whoever's out there on barehanded, rather than escalate things with my knife. Instead, I call my roommate who's in town, give her my location and what's happening. She said she'd be there in 10 minutes. I hung up and started walking again. The footsteps started up again now faster and out of sync with mine. That's when I got mad. I have a weird thing where fear makes me angry and hostile. Being stalked through the wood to push my buttons from terrified to murderous. So I now turn towards the woods with a voice I didn't know I had saying, how about you come on here? I'll rip you open. For the life of me, I don't know where I got those words from. It might have been a bad move. But the woods are now rather abruptly quiet. Nothing came at that moment. I stayed deadly still, staring hard, ready to jump at any moment. I now worry that they have a knife too. Then my roomie came. She turned the curve, I toss my bike in her car, and we get out of there. I was so scared when I got home, I threw up, falling asleep for hours. I never actually got to find out who was out there, but I'm sure they were looking for a weak target, and thank god for me, that wasn't me that day.